Welcome to Behavior Grooves, the podcast that explores stories, science, and secrets from the world's brightest thought leaders for the curious at heart. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We like to explore human behavior that will improve your relationships, your well-being, and your organization by helping you find your groove. From best-selling authors to researchers, you will learn insights from the sharpest minds in behavioral science, including psychology, behavioral economics, and neuroscience. Hey, Tim, we need to let our listeners know that we are on our way to our 250th episode. It's just a couple weeks away, and every single one of those episodes has been hosted on Podbean. Yeah, actually, it's pretty cool. Podbean hosts our podcast episodes and distributes them through Apple and Spotify to over 100 other pod listening apps on iOS and Android. And we have to say thank you to them. And to that end, you know, they're doing something special for us. Yeah, they are. So this month of episodes is being sponsored by Podbean. Podbean is the easiest way to create your own podcast. As Tim just said, we use Podbean to host behavioral grooves. Download the free Podbean podcast app to start, record, and publish your very own podcasts in minutes. Podbean provides everything you need to run your podcast, and you can record and publish episodes directly from the app on your phone. Not that Tim and I do that, but you could. You could. (laughs) Download the free Podbean app. App today that's p-o-d-b-e-a-n check it out absolutely wow that was that was really nicely done kurt well we've got <laughs> almost 250 episodes published on their platform i mean obviously we we use them and we've gotten kind of good at you know reading this stuff it's pretty cool <laughs> we certainly believe in their stuff, that's for sure. So let's get back to the episode. Okay, so today we're talking with our friend, world-renowned social psychologist, John Barge. We thought it would be good to follow up the conversation with Phil Zimbardo by hearing from John about his research on automaticity and context. John is a professor at the Yale University and has done groundbreaking work on automaticity, context, and embodied cognition. Like, how you feel and act when you're holding a warm cup of coffee versus a cold cup of iced tea. And he wrote a terrific paper from 2004 that says, nearly all forms of social representation can be primed, it seems, activated incidentally or unobtrusively in one context to influence what comes next without the person's awareness of this influence. It's very powerful stuff, and it aligns to him with what we talked with with Phil last week. Absolutely, it does. You know, the conversation we with we, that we have with John absolutely does not disappoint. As always, John's insights into our behavior are yeah, pretty much spot on. And we talked with him about how the context that we find ourselves in influences our behavior, often subtly, but often pretty significantly as well. Yeah, we discussed some other self-delusions we have, like standing up for mental health and Simone Biles, uh, what impacted uh, Zimbardo and what the the kind of impact that Zimbardo had on social psychology, and the one action that we can do that will increase our overall well-being. Ooh, that Mm. sounds pretty interesting. People need to listen to the end in order to hear what that is. So it's a little tidbit for people. Listen all the way through. Okay, so now sit back with a big refreshing sip of primed learning and enjoy our conversation with Dr. John Barge. John Barge, welcome to Behavioral Grooves again. Thank you, Kurt and Tim. It's always a pleasure. I, I look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks very much. We're going to get started. I really do. I do. I look forward to it. Somebody actually looking forward to talking with I, us, Tim. I, I don't know. Do. This will be, mark this day down. <laughs> a lot of people are scared of media and a little nervous beforehand. I, I actually look forward to this. It's always fun. It's, uh, you know, it's oh, great. Cool. Good. Cool. Well, let's get into our speed round. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Yeah, nice. Okay. All right. Do I have to explain these or do I no, just no, 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 okay. it's no, speed round. You, but if you want to explain if, if there's a if there's Pepsi a big is, story. Yeah, Pepsi doesn't have it's just sugar water. I mean, for me Pepsi was always sort of like <laughs> lots of sugar and yeah, Coke had an edge to it, you know. Especially early on when they started making it, right? But but uh yep. um with extra ingredients. But yeah, Coke. <laughs> Do you prefer Mexican, the Mexican Coke, or, or the, the the U.S. Coke? Oh, I've, have you had? I've heard. Yeah, no. There's a, a we have a place here called the Whole Enchilada, 
which is uh, you know has has the Mexican Coke. I've never tried it. Oh, it's was it's it worth it? Yeah, it is. It, it, it is. It, is. it, it reminds me of reminds me of the Coke I had when I was a kid. Right back yeah. before they they, oh they replaced God. all the. The, yeah. the cane sugar with all the other stuff that they do. Oh, I got to so, try yeah, it. Is good. it like cactus juice or something? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I'll try it. <laughs> cool. All right. Moving on. Speed round number two. Would you prefer to have dinner with William James, Sigmund Freud, or Albert Einstein? If you could go back in time, who would you prefer William, to have dinner J- with? William James. William James is not even close. Not even William close. James, not even close. Yeah. I love it. I love and, it. And, and why William James above those others? Because he was very introspective. He never spoke up at any faculty meetings. He was always thinking, always trying to figure things out. And he wrote a book that really captures it's still ho- almost perfectly true today with some minor exceptions when there wasn't any data. I mean, he basically did it by observation, by, intu- by, by introspection, by thought, by reasoning. Uh, and, and also ter- everything you read about him, he's a nice guy. I mean, everything about it is like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, would, I would love, I would love, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So imagine yourself as a world-class guitarist and you get the, you get a choice between having a jam session with Jimmy Page or Jimi Hendrix. Wow. <laughs> well, you know me, it has to be Jimmy Page, but boy, am I, boy, am I just, I mean, more I read and more I hear stuff about Hendrix in London in the 60s and, you know, the unfortunate way he, he passed away and all that. Clapton's book, by the way, Clapton has an autobiography uh, that, that talks about uh, his relationship with Jimi Hendrix, which was very close. And he was actually bringing Hendrix a guitar that he thought he would like the day that he found out he died the night before in London. So. Um, oh wow! Yeah, I mean Hendrix. That would have either one, yeah, but you know, I got to I got to go with Page. We we interviewed Rob Leonard, who was with uh, Shana Na, which again yeah. you kind of go, okay, Shana Na, um, who is now a forensic linguistic, uh, you know, world renowned for us for forensic linguistics. Yeah. Um, but he was talking about he they got Shana Na got to Woodstock because of their relationship with Jimi Hendrix. Oh wow! Like, Jimi yeah. Hendrix saw them play in some yeah. bar, and he liked what they were doing, and he they hung out with him and, wow. and Janice and who else, and, yeah. and it was crazy. Yeah, yeah, what a break! Yeah, yeah, yeah. remarkable yeah. guy, apparently. Yeah. All right, fine. Final, final speed round questions, and, and Tim, we need to re just rename this. Yeah, yeah, it's, not yeah, a it's speed just round our, our opening questions. All right. Nature versus nurture, which has a bigger impact on our daily behavior, our DNA or our environment? Well, of course, both. But if I was going to pick, say nature. No. OK. Yeah. And, and, and help us understand why you, if you had to pick, a, obviously, there is a, a combination of that. So I'm reading this pick. paper this morning, which is probably reversed on your screen. It's from yours on mine by Paul Rosen. Now, Paul Rosen. As you probably know, I'm sure you do, uh, is at University of Pennsylvania um, and was the mentor uh, advisor to, say, uh, John Haidt and others uh, and the yeah. role of disgust and eating and, and, uh, and, and these in our lives. And this, this is a fantastic 1976 paper I read when I was in graduate school. And I'm rereading it, but it's on the evolution of intelligence um, and access to the cognitive unconscious. And basically gives all the examples through the animal kingdom of bees and, you know, those those African fish that flop in the air from one puddle to the next without having any, you know, sight of what they're doing. They just know what to do. So all these amazingly intelligent uh, you know, um, uh, capabilities all through the, the animal kingdom. And, and he makes the point, as does Arthur Reber, you know, that all these systems are are there, they're locked in. Our, uh, Herb Simon said the same thing, they're, they're sort of locked in. And the starting points are all of our conscious and strategic um, uh, uh, use of them. And Rosen thinks intelligence basically is, is gaining more and more access to the uh, already existing intelligent unconscious systems. Uh, that we have in other animals, you know, the same thing. So, uh, oh, I think that that's that tips the scales, right? I mean, sure, we have epigenetics and we have learning. We have early personal experience of of planet Earth when we land here, and what are the local conditions and all that, and that's very important. And we soak that up when we learn we can trust people or we can't, and all these other things that happen very early in life. But if you're asking me one or the other, you know, it's uh, it, it's heavily on the on the side of nature. 
So hmm. do you think DNA, or excuse, excuse me, do you think that uh, environment inhibits or enables access, better access to that sort of original uh, intelligence? That's, it has to increase it, but uh, the uh, Rosin's argument is that uh, by, by, ga by gaining experience and exploring, what you do is you find new applications, new, new ways to use the existing sort of context mm. dependent or context restricted abilities that are meant for one thing, but the more you go and, 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 and try it out in other, other areas, then it more, gets more generalized. Uh, to a broader principle that you can use more widely, which increases your intelligence and adaptability. But um, with humans, you know, it, it basically um, uh, allows you to sort of know what's going on inside you because uh, as you as you sort of have these things, you know, there's a wonderful new paper by Fiery Cushman uh, at Harvard in psychology that, that says basically rationalization, uh, when we try to rationalize why we did what we did or, or made a choice that we did, it's basically going backwards and getting access to sort of the basic unconscious mechanisms that produce that action in the first place. And then we're not sure why we did or whatever. And and by by doing that, you gain access and you understand yourself better. Uh, you know thyself better. Uh, and it's really useful uh, for sort of a self-discovery and also to realize what's going on inside you to be able to control, do that or not do that as you see fit strategically in, in, in going forward. It's this fantastic paper in, in behavioral and brain sciences in the last few years. Um, I find that remarkable because it really connects the two, you know, and the same thing Rosin was saying, although in a different way, uh, 50 years ago. Wow. So obviously the, the area of research that you've done a lot of work in automaticity and, and priming is, is key for our listeners who may not be as familiar with that. Can you just give a, a brief description of what that research is about and describe yeah, or define yeah. automaticity Absolutely. and priming? Yeah. Sorry. I'm stopping all over you here. Um, yes. Um, it, it's basically what your topic is today. It's context. So what, what priming is, is the, con the contact between the outside world and, and your brain, the outside world and your mind. Um, and cues, it cues of uh, different kinds of psychological situations uh, that, uh, that you experience. So uh, for example, uh, people um, did Hank Arts, you know, fantastic study uh, who are on their, uh, given a, a envelope to take in the university and take it to the library, talk more, speak more quietly on the way to the library compared to if they were taking it to the president's office or the gym or some other location. Uh, when people are, are incidentally thinking about their mother's neighborhood, they start pursuing the goals they have when they're with their mother. Um, and I just saw something on the internet the other day that I thought was cute. And, uh, uh, it has other explanations. Basically, it, what it said was when, when you talk about people who make you happy, you become happy. And, and it's the same kind of thing. When, when you have active inside of you uh, the representation of a person, the goals you pursue with them, the experiences you have with them, uh, the general emotional tone of those experiences and all that, it's all active. And so you don't have to have the person physically there. Psychologically, that's what matters, the psychological situation. Um, and which, which can be different for different people, but it's cued by the context and the context can have a psychological effect as if you're there when you're not even there. So that's the importance of contact. And what, what, what priming does, it, it, it cues everything. So for example, people have different situated identities, the work of Ernst Fair with investment bankers who are very moral and honest unless they're reminded of their workplace. So if you ask him at home to flip a coin 20 times and how many heads did you get? You get like 20 bucks for every heads you flip, right? No one's gonna know. There's not like a, a camera on you like, like there is on me right now. Uh, they just have to report on email how many heads they flip. Well, they are actually pretty honest. The distribution in, of, of investment bankers in that condition with, without any prompting uh, follows the binomial theorem. It follows what you expect by chance. In another condition, they have them describe their workplace in physical terms, you know, what their office looks like and, and desks and arrangements and things like that. Well, that cues the psychological situation of being at work for these investment bankers, and now they're dishonest and immoral. They cheat. They over oh, gee whiz, I, I just flipped 20 heads. Oh, lucky me, you know, and they're all saying that, right? Oh, gee, I guess this can happen by chance. Oh, wow. You know, but these are the same people randomly assigned to one condition or the other, which identity they're home with their family or their workplace at the, at the UBS or, or Credit Suisse or whatever it is in Zurich. So 
there's lots and lots and lots on that. Uh, there's stuff on culture where people have uh, uh, to, uh, multiple, like bicultural people, uh, for example, from China who come and, and are students in the U.S. They have both their Chinese cultural identity and, and so forth, and they have the American one. And you can cue either one and produce different tech. You can have them act like North Americans. You can have, have them have the values of, China, of, of Chinese collective values or individualistic Western values, depending on if you ask them to name their favorite Chinese movie or favorite American movie or favorite Chinese food or favorite American food. By, by activating one or the other cultural identity, they switch back and forth in terms of their values, in terms of their uh, uh, cognition and everything else. So we're all very situated. Uh, we're, we're very tied to the different setting. We behave very differently uh, in private than we do in public. We behave very differently in a religious service than we do at a party. We, everything is sort of cued by the external environment and we have those representations. And even if we're not physically there, they, they make us pursue goals and, and feel certain ways as long as they're psychologically active. And this happens not necessarily at a conscious level. You're, you're, you're queuing these up with these questions, but you're not rationally thinking going, Oh, now I'm, I'm thinking of my Chinese heritage as opposed to my, you know, now living in America. So it happens at a subconscious level. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and when you, when you debrief people at the end of the study, they have no idea that what they did had an effect on the second thing they did. So Wendy Gardner at Northwestern a long time ago and, and Shira Gabriel, who's at Buffalo now. Uh, that this fantastic study has won awards ever since. Um, by having people proofread a manuscript and they're supposed to circle all the first person pronouns like I and me, or in a different condition, all the third person pronouns like we and us. Okay, now these are Hong Kong students or University of, I think it was Northwestern students, Northwestern University students. And then they gave them a, 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 a standard cultural values kind of inventory where you see classic uh, East Asian versus uh, Western uh, North American differences in, in values of freedom and individualism versus collectivity and the family and all those things. What, what they did was they turned the Hong Kong students into North Americans if they circled the I's and the me's. And they turned the, the Northwestern students into Hong Kong cultural values if they circled the, the we and the us. And the importance of that <laughs> is that it was, a, it was a, a landmark study because it broke through the old cultural psychology of saying Chinese are different than Americans mm. without saying why or how. Oh, they're different. OK, fine. But why? How are they? You know, they're not. We're not that different, really. We have we have the same machinery. But by making it temporarily active in one versus the other, you can switch and make people culturally the opposite culture or the different culture. Um, and, and really, you know, that's the same principle as what I just said with the Asian Americans who, who came from uh, uh, to American universities. They, they have both cultural identities. The, the Swiss bankers have both work and home identities. And you can sort of activate one or the other and, and make them moral or immoral, depending on what's going on in their head. And how long do those effects last? That's a very good question because, uh, uh, for example, we have done studies where we turned uh, conservatives into liberals. Some people have done studies where they turned liberals into conservatives. And I'm sure politicians would love it if those were more permanent effects. Uh, <laughs> or maybe they wouldn't like it. Um, but uh, they certainly try to do it temporarily, you know, around election time. Um, I'm trying to persuade people without their realizing it. How long did they last? You know, it, it, we were trained when we did experiments. And now a lot of it's done online and, and people do them from their home. But when we had people come into a laboratory and do experiments, that you cannot, the ethical principle is people should not leave any different than as they come in. They used to say any worse off, but I think mm. it's really any different, right? We don't want to uh, make a permanent change. So these have always been assumed to be temporary. And, and I do think they are temporary and fleeting because other things happen and you think of other things and new things become active in your mind. The old things go away and all that because there's certainly so much going on, you know, impinging on your senses. But we don't really know. We really don't know. The evidence pretty much is that they're temporary and there's very few longer lasting ones. Um, but we, I don't think that's really a closed book. Yeah, and it goes to we we interviewed Philip Zimbardo, who was the episode before this, and he obviously was famous for his Stanford prison experiment. Basically, the idea that he put these well-adjusted, as you said, college students 
and he put them into a situation. That situation cued various different elements within them. Some of them were prisoners, some of them were guards, and the guards started to act after a certain period of time in a in a very deviant, negative per you know way, and the prisoners <laughs> kind of started acting in a submissive. There, there was a revolt for a, a piece of it, but for the most part, it was a submissive, you know, kind of subjective way aspect of that. And how, from your perspective, I mean, that was it was a big study that got international fame. How did that impact the overall research in social psychology? You know. Well, that's a complicated question in, in some <laughs> respects, because I'll tell you, my, one of my pet peeves about um, being in, in my field is that when things produce strong effects, and, and of course, some of the guards broke down and were uh, uh, very upset with themselves uh, for what they did and how they yep. acted as guards. And because of that, basically, those studies were outlawed. Because you can't, again, have someone leave an experiment worse off than they, they were before. And, and exactly. basically, it, it's happened in Milgram, too. With Milgram, uh, a lot of the people were very upset that they had shocked this poor guy having a heart attack, you know, and they thought he was dead. And they're still shocking him. And, and they learned something about themselves. But see, you know, actually, they didn't. Because what they learned was the power of the situation on themselves. They weren't like this. In fact, uh, Zimbardo... Uh, 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 had people complete a lot of personality inventories and personality scales before they were brought into the jail. And they were randomly assigned to be guards or prisoners. And that was the most important part. They weren't pre-selected to be a guard or prisoner based on personality. And their personality measures, none of them predicted how they would act. Uh, and so this was actually hated by personality psychologists. This is one of these <laughs> strong situational influences, right? You know, the same thing with the Good Samaritan study of, of uh, Darley and Batson, where the, personal, where the personality stuff didn't predict at all who would run by, by the sick person on the sidewalk of the Princeton Seminary. It was whether they were late to the next class. And yeah. that's what, that's, that, was the, that was the predictor of whether they would go by. So, uh, again, context and goals of the moment override all these sort of longer-term things in many cases. And the thing about Zimbardo, he was a showman. I mean, and he still is a showman. Yes. Um, he, he, there's legendary stories of him teaching introductory psychology at uh, Stanford, where, for example, he'd smoke a cigarette on stage and uh, as he's giving his lecture. Well, he put a wire into the cigarette so that the ash would never drop off. And this thing got longer and longer. And people are like mesmerized by what is this ash finally going to fall? And he says, and he knocked it off and he said, there's going to be a quiz on what I just said on Friday. I bet none of you paid any attention to it. He was manipulating <laughs> them. He was saying, because you're fascinated, but you don't have to listen to what I'm saying. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if he really carried through, but, but he would do that. He came and gave a talk once when I was at, uh, uh, on sabbatical in Mannheim, Germany. Now, Mannheim, Germany is on the, on the Rhine River, and uh, the Rhine sort of meanders through, uh, or a river that goes into the Rhine, I forget. I think it's the Rhine. It's not a very big river, so maybe not. But anyway, there's a river that goes through. And people can arrive in Mannheim by boat uh, going up and down the river. And there's actually a, 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 like a station, a platform, like it was a train, you know, when they get off. So he comes to give his talk at Mannheim. He doesn't come by the train. He doesn't come by, you know, any other way. He comes by boat, of course. This is Phil Zimbardo with a magician's uniform and a, 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 a magician's uh, uh, costume on with a top hat, with a black top hat. And and very flamboyant and a, a wand or something with his hand. He comes off like like his big arrival in Mannheim. I'm sure he did this everywhere. Um, but uh, that that's that that's what that's why people love Phil. I mean that the thing about Phil was he was he's bigger than a psychologist. He's bigger than a, a professor. You know he had this whole thing going on. Um, the, you, know, you look at his website, the giant Z that you see on Zimbardo.com, you know, um, he's just big, larger than life by far. I mean, just uh, amazing. And so who else would have done this study? Who else would have turned the basement of Jordan Hall into this kind of thing? Yeah. We found out that uh, his father built uh, one of the first TVs in the Bronx because he was particularly adept at, at mechanical things and put things together wow. in electronics. And wow. uh, so that when they got to world, watch the world first World Series uh, on TV, yeah. he had his friends over and he charged them 25 cents a piece. <laughs> 
How old was he when this happened? He was like, young, 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 like, yeah, early, kid, early yeah. teens. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's neat. Yeah. But one of the interesting pieces, and, and I think you bring this up, is that the idea that they had run the personality uh, inventories prior to this element and that it was the situational aspects of this that really put people into the behaviors that they subsequently then elicited. <laughs> right. With the that, yeah. And, and so how much... As we think through our, you know, as, as we're going through our everyday lives and, and who we are, uh, what is interesting for me is that this idea that the situation is driving a lot of my behavior, a lot of my thinking. Yeah. And is who, who is the real person underneath? I, I'm just trying to f- figure out, like, the implications from this study, as well as Milgram's and Solomon Ashes, and then e- the work that you do, the work that, you know, has been done in this arena kind of, you know, it can be scary for people because you're going, well, how much am I in control versus how much is the situation that I'm in in control? Right. Well, a lot of this is because of, I I don't want, I think arrogance is probably too strong of a word, but uh, we really have a belief that we know ourselves and we have Mm. a belief that we know what we would do in a situation. Let me give an example. Milgram is an example where it was totally wrong. Less than when, psych, when a panel of psychiatrists were, he asked to predict how far along would they shock? How, what's the maximum shock people would give? I think less than one percent said that they would go more than fifty mm. points, and of course they went all the way to six twenty or something like that. So they were totally off. So the psychiatrists supposedly who knew people and all that uh, were very well, way off. But here's a I think an even better example. There's a, a, a PhD in law and psychology uh, who's now at Cornell named Rosanna Summers and works with Vanessa Bones, which you, I'm sure you know Vanessa. Um, and her dissertation uh, with Tom Tyler at the Yale Law School, and she was, I was on her committee because she was a joint degree with psychology, uh, was on consent. And it's fascinating. Con- the topic of consent legally um, uh, is 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 uh, and, and really interesting, and I think it's uh, very interesting psychologically too. And I'd love to get more into it. But here's the study. So people are asked. Uh, they come into a, 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 a psych experiment, and they're asked, uh, "Here's the hy- following hypothetical situation: The experimenter comes up to you and asks you to unlock your cell phone, and because they want to take it in the other room and see everything that's on it, would you do this?" 25% say yes, 75% say no. Would a reasonable person do this? 18% are, are reasonable people are estimated to do this. So 82% would never do this. Okay, you cannot probably see what's coming. What The other condition is they come in and they actually ask them, here, unlock your cell phone. I want to take it in the other room and look and see what's on it. 99.7% do it. Wow. Now, that's obviously completely the opposite of what people say they were going to do. But see, her, this is her point. When you actually have a person in authority, like in Milgram, you know, or, or Zimbardo, when you actually, well, the, the, Zimbardo was the warden of the Stanford prison, right? Exactly. And, and if you ever see the movie, the slideshow they made, he's cackling half the time, <laughs> like some evil you know, guy. Um, but this is the thing, when you're actually in the situation, you're different because the pressures and the, the peer pressure or the authority figure pressure or the obedience and all that of the compliance, the, the um, conformity, like an ash, right? All these things are very powerful and we don't realize that. We just think that we're in control. And so in a minor way, I you know, arrogance is too strong, but we're a little too arrogant about our own personal control and ability to do what we want, even in the face of these situational forces. We grossly, this is what Lee Ross always preached too. The late Lee Ross and and, uh, mm-hmm. and and Phil Zimbardo was at his memorial service virtually and, and said a lot of wonderful things about Lee. That this, the power of the situation is so underappreciated, and and we just think that we're the only one, we're the captain of our ship, and all that. I think a little less arrogance, a little more humility, would actually go a long way in helping us actually take more control because now we would know what we might actually succumb to or, or, or fall prey to in these situations and then do something about either avoiding the situation or doing something different, being prepared in advance, you know, for it and, uh, you know, maybe do better. 
and, and actually take and actually end up having more free will in terms of actual control over what we think and do than believing in total free control gives us because we're totally vulnerable to these things. I thought that was an amazing new version of the Milgram study when when um, Rosanna showed that effect with the cell phones. Yeah, John. To what degree do boundaries have? I mean, it, it, it is. I can't imagine uh, someone who is, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a, let's say very uh, anti-violence and you, you try to prime them with the idea that they could be violent and then they go out and commit a violent act, right? I mean, there are some boundaries on this, right? Well, absolutely. And the way to do, the, the proper way to do a priming study is you can only prime what's in the person's head. This is the whole idea. It's a passive activation of content that's already in the person's head. You can't prime a, a person who, who would never commit murder, has doesn't have the goal, doesn't have that thought, doesn't have that wish or anything, uh, because there's nothing in the head to prime. Uh, the primes outside, the people think of priming almost like like they're like uh, Skinnerian SR psychology, you know, like the external <laughs> cue is the only thing that matters. And, you know, we've written this for 30 years now that the difference and people have slammed us for being behaviorists, you know, but the difference is, you know, Skinner said nothing in the head matters. And, you know, I always thought that was like, you know, uh, taking your car to a mechanic and saying, fix it, you know, but you can't lift the hood. <laughs> and and what, if you lift the hood and you see the mechanisms inside and you can, you know, fix the, the same thing with the human mind, it's mediating these things, right? So it has to be what's in the head. So I'll give you an example. We did uh, research a while ago at NYU on power and the effects of power on people. And people say power corrupts and makes you all selfish. Well, yeah, for maybe most people or the majority or something, maybe that's true. But really what power does is... By definition, power means the ability, of your ability to get what you want without mm. other people blocking it. Well, for those situations, people go for what they really want when they have the ability to get what they want without obstruction or blockage from other people. And then you, like Lincoln said, if you want to find out a person's true character, give them power. You know, everyone can withstand adversity. They don't have a choice, but give them power and you'll see what their real character is. So what we did in advance was to find out what kind of interpersonal orientations these people, these, these participants had. And my colleague, uh, Mark Clark, a long time ago, uh, showed that a lot of people have these sort of communal orientations, like a parent for a child or a, a good mentor to their to their mentee, you know, um, and, and uh, sort of a caring what's good for them, not what's good for me kind of thing. You know, good doctors are that way. Well, not everybody's like that, but we could pre-select. So what happened was we put people in a power situation and the people with the, you know, selfish kinds of, of goals became more selfish. Uh, they, they took more of things. They, they gave uh, more work for other people to do and didn't do it themselves. But the communal people were the opposite. When you gave them power, they became less selfish. They became more uh, you know, caring about other people, uh, more other-oriented. They took more of the work if they had power than they did without power. They became less racist on these scales and less, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, anti other people when they had power. Other people came, became more racist, and uh, because they felt like they could just say what they want with no repercussions. So, what this means is that the same situation of having power over others, others' outcomes, affects people differently. depends Depends on what's in their head. Depend, depending on what their basic goals are. Uh, and so it's not just the outside world and the outside situation that matters. It's, it's what's in the head. I, I see a lot of priming studies that don't bother to see if the stuff is really in their head. Like, for example, a, a stereotyping study done in the U.S., they, they do it in Europe and find no effects. Well, you know what? The stereotypes are different there. You know, yeah. what's in the head is different. And also, what's, what might have been true in 1970, 1980 isn't necessarily true today. And say, oh, this doesn't replicate from 1980. Well, you know what? Maybe what, what's in the person's head uh, has changed what in, in the in the society's uh, heads has changed so you know that's to me you know um, when people do exact replications they also have to exactly replicate what's in the participants heads not just what the outside materials are and if they don't bother to do that then they're not doing exact replication because back then people had certain attitudes they had certain stereotypes uh, maybe they they had majority of them had certain goals that they don't have today you know, we have made some progress on attitudes towards children, attitudes towards animals, the kind of things that, you know, doctors and teachers and, you know, got away with in the 70s and 80s now coming to light, uh, you know, like Nasser and those people. I mean, this kind of stuff went on a lot back then. 
You know, mm. I don't want to get into personal stuff, but I know it went on a lot. I had my own experiences in school and, and with doctors. Uh, and so it was pretty, it was more common than you might think back then. And, and fortunately, our attitudes and our um, uh, knowledge and awareness of those things is changing. And it's not the same as it was back then. I mean, you can even go to the Olympics, which are going on today, and Simon Biles, who is, you know, checked out for yeah. mental health reasons. Yeah. And I was talking with my wife about this going, two Olympics ago, if that would have happened, the the virtual that she would have gotten would have been, I mean, it's it's bad enough today. But, yeah. the, but if you would have gone back two Olympics ago, that would have been unheard of. It would right. have been, she would have been vilified. All of these things. And I think that attitude, that perception, as you talk about, has changed as yes. mental mental health awareness has has increased. People understand the pressure that these athletes are on, that they're yeah. human, that they're, that this is a this is a person first. And yeah. Yeah. and particularly I heard somebody was talking about their kids and they were showing I forget who the who the gymnast was who who did the the vault and she had a she had already like injured her leg and you could Carrie. see when she landed. Carrie yeah. Shrug, Carrie Shrug. Yeah. yeah. And that, that was, and, and they showed that to their kids. They go, why did she do that? That is just wrong. She shouldn't have been in this position. He goes, well, she won this medal. And they go, that doesn't matter. She was putting herself in, at risk. And so I think the generational gaps, the awareness of these things are changing. And as you said, if you try to replicate something from 1970, we are in a different world. And how can you expect that same outcome if you are having different, you know, different pieces of your mind that are not going to be the same as they were? That, that's then. absolutely. There's so much to say in response to that. But, you know, I think one, one reason Carrie did that uh, was because Bella, Bella Lugosi, I mean, Bella Caroli was her, uh, was her gymnastics, uh, uh, you know, and she was probably f afraid of him. But she, what guts, I mean, what amazing you know, courage to know that was going to happen when she did this. I mean, not to have it happen. Oh my God. But she knew that was going to be a horribly painful uh, landing and yeah. she still did it and stuck it. Yeah. Yeah. John, this, this work on, on interpersonal uh, orientation is really interesting. And I'm wondering how, how this kind of works with corporations. Uh, do, do you think people self-select to some degree into corporate cultures uh, and I'm thinking right now we're living in a in a very dramatic time, right? Where we have companies now that are coming out and saying, Google says, you're not going to be allowed back into the office unless you are vaccinated. And, yeah. and then we have, you know, somebody like uh, JP Morgan that says, if you don't come back to the office, you're going to, you're going to take a pay cut. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, there's this dramatic stuff. Do you th could you imagine em um, employees starting to sort of self-select and say, I'm, huh. I'm going to start choosing the, the kind of company that I want to work with. I think if you've got that ability, you, you do that. Yeah, sure. I think that there's, it's nice because it's, it's along the lines of the athletes and the um, Osaka and Biles and then saying, you know what, you know, we're the human capital here. We're the talent. And, uh, and I think that's spreading. It's, it's really nice to see. Uh, I don't have to put up with this. You know, what about the actresses, the starlets, you know, the actresses and actors who are like just starting out 20 and 22 and here comes Kevin Spacey or here comes um, uh, Matt Lauer or whoever who has power. And, you know, it's it's like, no, we don't have to put up with this. And and, and in, the, in the old days, you went public and people are like, oh, shut up. You know, we don't believe you and that kind of thing. Now, now, thanks to Me Too and now you know, these other kinds of um, uh, athletic um assertions of, of, of their own rights uh, and, and, uh, and, and their own um, worth. You know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not just a cog in the American uh, Olympic machine that all the Olympic officials can take uh, pride and, and boast and glow because I did something. You know, you're, you, you, I, have a, I, have a, I have a suspicion about Biles here. I don't think it's come out yet. I think that she went to the, the coaches or the, the coaching staff and told them, and they said, go out and do it anyway. And she mm. basically said, screw you to hell with that. And then walked out. I, I, I have a feeling that's my, what happened here. Um, same thing with Osaka and the French uh, Open. You know, and yeah. the French Open officials were like, well, you know, I, I hope, uh, I wish her well with her recovery. And, uh, you know, uh, everyone else is doing these things. And why isn't she? And in other, in other words, everyone else is doing what they're told. And we're telling them to do it. And you're not. Well, and, you know, bad you. You're not going to be allowed to come to these events anymore. Forgetting that. People come to see her. I mean, she's, yeah. 
see, people want to see Naomi Osaka. They don't want to see the, the head of the French Open. And, <laughs> and they're the talent. And when the, the talent walks, you know, and, and the talent, you know, people, I, I don't know. I don't know. I know she, I know Biles has taken a lot of heat on social media. I know. Because she's not, maybe it's a lot of it's racist even. But um, she's not patriotic. She doesn't put her team first. She does all these kinds of things. But she's making a broader point. You know, the American Olympic officials let those gymnasts down the way they did not protect them from Nasser and for not, not protect them from other predators. And they don't seem to really care. Mm. You know, and I know that was true in the 80s. I actually uh, was in a relationship with one of the team in the 1984 Olympics um the gymnasts and so i know some you know basically it was it was it's always been horrible for them it's always been treated like uh uh you know basically abuse has been there forever emotional especially maybe some physical even so i think i got way back. off track of your question <laughs> we, just, we, we did but that's okay yeah, this is sorry, fantastic. Right? The, the going back to business and thinking through some of the implications of what you're just talking about though there's a if and, and granted, there is that big if, if people can self-select, if they have that that ability to choose, yeah. then in the long run, maybe not in the immediate, but in the long run, those companies that are better able to attract yes. those individuals who are going to be the superstars, who are going to be, so the French Open may not get, you know, the top tier tennis players because yes. of what they've done. And it may go to the US Open or to Wimbledon or to wherever else and right. and different pieces. So they're going to by default then become the the better the better sport event or the better yes. organization. So yes, I think it's yes. a really important piece from what you're talking about here. Yeah. No, that's 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 really it's just nice. I mean, you know, the the the, the that they're standing up and, and saying, you know, for my own mental health, I'm not going to put up with this uh, with this garbage that I get from the media and from the journalists uh, that makes me feel so down and low and worthless, you know. And and it just it's nice when people stand up and say, I don't have to do this, you know. I don't have to put up with this because I'm told to. I can I can um, uh, I cannot. And 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 I'll I'll take the consequences. Okay, so if you ban me from all all the major tournaments, that's too bad. Then I'll be banned. And um, uh, and Biles the same way. She's going to take the heat. She knows it. But she's such an amazingly strong person in so many ways that that she's taking this opportunity to make a statement that you know if my head isn't there, if my if I'm not really there inside, I'm totally confident and totally motivated, I'm putting my life at risk. That's kind of mm. stuff she does with the quadruples and everything. She could break her neck in, in a split second. I mean, she could be dead. She could be injured for life, a, a, a cripple. You know, yeah. a, 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 you know, all these terrible things could happen, the risk she puts her body through. And if she's not totally mentally there, then she's taking that risk. And no one should tell her that she has to go out anyway. So, it's, you know, but, you know, it takes the Simone Biles maybe to be able to do that and an, an Osaka to do that. But, but they're they're helping the people who are not, up, you know, that high on the ladder for the future. So, John, we've we've talked about, obviously, how the situation drives a lot of that behavior and obviously being put in a in the Olympics or in the, um, you know, on the French Open, the situation is driving them to perform. I mean, that the idea that they they just don't go out and do it is you know not what the that situation is driving them to do with all their coaches the expectations all the other pieces that go into that so is there something that you think they uh you know Biles and Osaka have done that have allowed them to be able to do this because again they're pushing against that yes. context they're pushing against the situation see what pioneers and leaders do is they give an alternative example for the other people mm. and say you know what you don't have to do this here's what i did and then they can say you know what i admire this person and i'm going to do what she did she had good reasons and it really gives them some some um uh i want this a perfect word that i can't i can't capture but it gives them some um ability to follow suit uh some cover you know, uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not doing this on my own. Um, I'm doing what, what she did for the same reasons. And, um, yeah, that's what, that was, that's what leaders do. They do something different and they set a new example. John, I'm curious about the future. Uh, I'm wondering about two things. One is what are you working on now? And the, the second part is, is there sort of a direction that you feel like the, the work in automaticity and context and priming, needs to be going that it might not be 
doing enough of or going there fast enough now? Yeah, well, yeah, the, to take the latter one first, and by the time I finish, I'll forget the first one. But um, <laughs> I'll remind you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, you know, there, there there's a lot of, um, uh, I think what the problem I'm seeing is psychology is being swallowed up by behavioral economics and other other uh, 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 fields where there's lots more money, um, where there's funding, where, you know, these things um, have a financial payoff uh, in, in behavioral economics. But, but uh, the, the problem is, yes, it, it helps um, to uh, focus on, on, on financial decision makers and people who handle, because they're the vast amounts of money they, they deal with. And, and, uh, and, and this is, this is very worthwhile research on, on them, but not everybody's financial consultant or financial decision maker or uh, has this kind of power in corporations. And I, there's sort of a, a, a less and less interest in, in mundane daily life of people when, um, you know, there's, there's not that, you know, the important decisions that are not that important. They're just mundane. And that's what psychology is about. You know, it's about subjective experience and it's about, uh, you know, life in everyday situations. And that's what, that's what I've always focused on is, you know, the, the, the unconsciousness of everyday life or the, the role of unconscious processes in everyday life of people. And, you know, there's less and less interest in that. Um, the problem is when we, when we, we focus on decision makers, well, they're, they're intentionally and consciously and deliberately making important decisions. That is part of life, but it's not to say that that's the psychology of everybody. And then everybody's always making conscious. Things. There's lots and lots of contexts of life when we're reacting to things, when we're just doing things, when we're feeling emotions and all that, we're not always making decisions. And we, we're not always at a, a workplace where we're doing that. So the generality of principles um, derived from the study of, of people making decisions all the time doesn't, is not all that relevant to the rest of life for the, for the rest of us. If, if that could be reversed or there'd be more interest in just, uh, you know, how we muddle through life and maybe what we can do to make it better for ourselves, even though we're not, uh, in, you know, handling vast sums of money, um, you know, I think that would be nice. But, but the trend is the other way, right? The trend is, is going away from the Milgram type studies of, of uh, realistic situations um, with, with people who have a job as a prison guard or are prisoners and all that to, to a different group of people. And, um, we shouldn't lose track of how that's circumscribed. That's a that's part of life, but that shouldn't be generalized to all of all of psychology or all of life. So back to yeah, the first the part first of the part? question. Well, that was about what are you working on right now? Where where are you finding joy and, yeah. and engagement? In, so that's in your that's research? it. Yeah. So I've been asked basically. I've been catching up on all the chapters I agreed to do, and I've you know gotten three knocked out this year. And I'm not the fastest as people are to do these kind of things, but it really is bringing everything together and, and looking at just everyday life. Arthur Reber, who was, you know, one of the pioneers with Paul Rosen of the cognitive unconscious back 50 years ago has a book coming out with Oxford. And I wrote a couple chapters for that, but, but trying to, to explain, you know, uh, how these things matter in, um, in, in people's lives, you know, just uh, the effects of the past of uh, their, their early childhood, maybe the effects of recent experience carrying over and affecting how they understand the present and how their goals and motives for the future affects how they feel and evaluate things right now. And all about the psychological situation, which is, you know, the Lee Ross kind of thing. Um, but uh, I would like to, I am starting, I'm, I, you know, it'll be slow. I'm, I'm going to do another book. Uh, I got stacks of stuff and notes around me here and just waiting for a, a semester off so I can really get some traction on it. Um, but, uh, you know, trying to do applied things uh, with Gary Latham, for example, you guys know from, uh, from uh, the fireside chat thing uh, back yep. in January. So, so Gary's, you know, going into actual organizations and people are going in health psychology, trying to help people to, you know, eat more healthily. And Gary's trying to get people to, uh, you know, be more cooperative, but also uh, more productive and all that. And, um, we're, we're very interested in, in applying this to safety, for example. Can, are there ways that we can sort of get people to really be concerned with their personal safety, safety of others in dangerous occupations and dangerous workplaces? And trying to take what we know about uh, these nudges, you know, and, and um, um, try to uh, see if we can help in, in real, real situations, real life organizations and settings. So there's that. Um, 
but I just love reading, you know, this Paul Rosen thing I haven't read for so long. I'm just like, wow, I just, I, it's just, it's a scholar thing. It's, it's reading and scholarship. It's old fashioned, old school, you know, but that's, I love that. That's what I love to do. I always do it. Yeah. I retire. I'll still do it. Yeah. I just love, I just love the stuff so much. And I always have, I was so lucky to get a job where I could, you know, get money for, for, you know, get paid for doing what I would have done anyway. <laughs> it, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful job if you can get it right that's when you, right when that, when that that's happens right. that's right all right so so thinking about this I, i'm gonna ask two big broad questions here one's gonna be more positive and one maybe a, a little bit negative i'll ask the positive one first so so given all these situations these contexts you know that that we have that we're in you know what can we do to better prepare ourselves if we don't want to end up like either being one of the guards that it acts deviant or one of the prisoners who apps who acts submissive in the Stanford prison experiment in real world. We have the, yeah. you know, everyday life. What can we do? Right. Is there anything we, that your research has shown? Yes. Yes. We can stop and question ourselves. We can, we can notice like, like for example, we have poison ivy surrounding us here. Uh, three acres of poison ivy, basically the most evil plant in the in the world, and uh, and it's horrible. And every summer, of course, I get some on me somehow, even though I try. It's, I'm petting the dog; the dog was running in it. Whatever. So I have to take steroids to get rid of it because otherwise, it lasts forever and it's horrible. I take steroids; they make you, you know, roid rage. They make you angry, and I find myself really being uh, having a shorter fuse and getting more upset with things uh, that that are everyday things than I should. So my dog, he was laying right down here, you know, does his usual bad stuff, and I just just yell, scream, and I want to kick him, and I never do that. And I I, I know now, and I think, wait a minute, you know, this feels right. I feel like I'm justified. I feel this is right, but I know this was contribution here from mm. the steroids and I can stop and pull myself in and not do the things that feel natural and right. So you, the one thing you want to know is, is sometimes things feel right and natural and they're not. And, you, and especially if it's something that, that is different than you usually do, you might want to think, you know, what is it that's contributing here? What's, what's, uh, what is it that I, that I don't really, or you have a bad outcome. I, I tell my little girl when she was tiny that I, I don't have time for her. I'd rather just, uh, you know, relax and, and not uh, do something with her. Five seconds later, I feel horrible guilt. And what am I doing? You know, and, and so when you have those moments, um, you realize that there are other things going on besides your intentions and besides what you're aware of and think about what those might be and maybe, you know, make some plans about how to do things differently from now on. But if you don't believe that and think that you're just always right, however, however you feel and the other person's wrong, you'll never make any changes and you'll keep doing those things over and over. Hmm. And my second question was going to be in, in the last episode, you left us with, uh, just this advice you said uh you gave some parting advice to say to hug your child um you said that that was if you go out and hug your child hug your child a lot because it's just going to make a big difference in you and and your child i'm not sure now you just your last answer might be the answer but i was going to say what's your parting advice for our listeners today that's still really good advice. Can I use that one again? <laughs> yes. No, yeah. man. I want something new. Come on. We're always, well, we're, we're novelty you know, seeking. Here we go. The nice thing, the nice thing about, well, I don't know what is the truth is like a big claim, right? But yeah. when I read, when I read Paul Rosen and I hear him saying <laughs> stuff that now we're saying 50 years later, I think there's something there, right? Because he was saying it for other reasons. And it's the same kind of thing we're saying now about, you know, accessing these unconscious things is the way to get more intelligent. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, accessing these things and knowing more about them is a way to take more control over your life. It's the same thing. And it was 50 years ago. So the hugs, they have to do with this mechanism that little kids have, tiny infants have. And, and they don't know, they're ignorant in the, in the purest sense of the word. They are ignorant of the world and they're ignorant of things. And, and they're very, very impressionable, but they sense that warmth and that's, the, that's a primitive signal. The signal is you can trust this person. And that trust then carries over the rest of their life. I mean, the more I read about this, these early attachment and bonding experiences mm. last the rest of your life. And, and you think, well, you don't know about them and why do they persist? Well, basically the, the research is you seek, people seek out 
about the people who were like that when they were that little. And so they perpetuate it. They find people who are basically, and they, they, they sort of uh, gravitate towards people who are like that, and they keep perpetuating that early experience over and over. That's part of the reason. So there's that. The other thing people are sort of recognizing now, and, and, and it's that like Vanessa Bone's uh, new book coming out in September. I don't get any uh, money for, for promoting her book. <laughs> um, September 1st. But the title of the book is You Have More Influence Than You Think. And this is exactly the, the idea of, of, if you want to call it priming or contagion and so forth, that what you do is seen by other people. And it's an example, a natural, it's a natural effect on them. So the smiling, the niceness, the holding the door for somebody else, all those feed it forward, pay it forward kinds of things are absolutely right. And we do have more influence than we think because we're affected by other people doing it. And they're affected by us. We don't realize that we are also a cause. We just feel like we're the experiencer and we're the effect uh, and, the, and the passive recipient. But we're also actively doing things that are really people are watching, people are looking, people are learning, people are doing the same things that we're doing. Um, and so that, that the advice is be a good example. You, you really that. do have a ripple effect out of, out of what you do to other people far more than you might think. I love it. Yeah, I, I I think with that we just have to say thank you so much for being a a guest, John. As always, it's a pleasure to, to chat with you and to catch up on all this stuff. And um, thanks for being a guest on Behavioral Grooves. Tim and Kurt, thank you once again. I always learn something too. You know, just I, I always get something out of these things. You know, it's it's a, it's a wonderful show, and uh, I always love being on it. So please have me on again sometime when. Um, uh, when you're ready for it, you know, it takes a while, I know, to get over it, but um, maybe in the future, you know, <laughs> some, some distant future, you can do it again. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our discussion with John, have a free flowing conversation, and talk about whatever else comes into our preconditioned, temporarily primed brains. Oh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> it is a mouthful, but it's a brainful I, too. <laughs> it's a brainful. No, it's not. It's not a brainful, but it is interesting. I, I always talking to John is wonderful because he brings these concepts back to some basics. We get pretty convoluted sometimes and various different things. And he's just brings it back down to the basics. And I, yeah. and I love how he talks about automaticity and context and all of these other factors. And he just has a nice way of being able to present that in a way that, Hey, I get it. And if I can get it, most everybody else can too. <laughs> I, well, I feel the same way. Like John's the kind of guy who I feel like if we would have met in high school, like I could have been buddies with him. Like he is way, way smarter than me. And yet he doesn't, you know, he doesn't kind of create this loftiness. He creates this very down to earth thing. He talks about psychology as being, you know, we study the mundane. Yeah. And, and I love that, that not just the humility of it, but just the ability to say, we're going to, in, in psychology, we're actually going to just look at very simple, rudimentary day to day stuff. Nothing why, fancy. Why do we why do we do this instead of that? And it doesn't yeah. have to have an economic impact. It's just about right. who we are as individuals and making our lives maybe a little bit better, which is what I love about the umbrella of behavioral science. It isn't just behavioral economics, it is behavioral science, which expands mm -hmm. the world in which we can explore and the world of human behavior and why we do what we do, which is why we do this podcast. There you go. That's it. That's why we do it. Okay. All right. Kurt, where do you want to start? Um, th this, uh, so this was interesting. You asked him that question about, you know, does priming, how long does priming last? Basically, how long yeah. after these pieces? And I love this idea that, you know, he said the evidence is pretty much that it's just a temporary piece that, yeah. that, yeah, you can be primed. And in that moment, you will change your behavior, but that prime goes away. And you are not necessarily going to do that behavior again. It's not like you've all of a sudden changed who you are or who your personality is or how you behave. It is a temporary component. However, like when he was talking about Milgram and the participants in the Milgram experiment, and he talked about that, he said something that like they might be able to learn something about themselves. 
right? But he said, um, you know, actually they didn't learn something about themselves. What they actually learned about was the power of the situation on their on themselves. And that's a kind of a cool insight. Like in some ways you gotta go, wouldn't it be great if everybody could be in a psychological experiment? Oh my god. To have the opportunity to to say, this is what it this is who I am who I think I am, I should say. And then this is me in the experiments. Like, wait a minute, that's not what I thought. Like, oh, I have that experience. So this is what happens in situations that I'm not familiar with. And it, my inability to predict my own specific behavior could be illuminated to me. I think just think we have to replicate that seven and a half billion times. That's, <laughs> that's, that's I don't know thought. if we want to replicate Milgram study seven and a half well, billion no, times. No, that no, might no. be, you know, I think there's some issues <laughs> with that study about that, but, but to your yeah. point, I, I think you're right. This idea that because we have this belief that we are in control of us, that we have this agency about ourselves that yeah. would override that situation. I mean, when, again, I love this, the, how he pointed out, they asked the psychologists how many people would actually go all the way on the Milgram's experiment and all of the psychologists in forecasting were wrong. Yes. I mean, they, yeah. they really didn't understand it. We, we talked later about the, the cell phone studies. And again, this idea of people anticipating what they're going to do but then in the actual situation, what they do is vastly different. And I think right. that humility that comes with understanding that, all right, maybe I'm not as in control of everything that I think yeah. I am would be good. Although I think we see that in our everyday lives, we just rationalize it away. Absolutely. And we are rarely presented with the opportunity, like in Scott Jeffrey's study he did at the University of Chicago on, on the um, incentives. You know, after the group that is rewarded with massages gets their reward, they say, well, you know, two thirds of them said, well, I think I'd just rather have money. But the people that, that got, the, got the massage performed more than double better than the people that got the money. Yeah. And so it's like, we, we, we rarely get into those situations where we actually can compare. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I want everybody to go through a study. Yeah. Not, but not Milgram. Not Milgram study. <laughs> Just maybe, maybe the cell phone study. Maybe the idea of like, hey, you know, how, how likely are you going to just be able to share all of your, your cell phone content and give that to them? And well, yeah, I'm not going to yeah. do that. Well, and maybe that would give us a better perspective. Like Zimbardo said, it's not about drawing the evil out in someone. It's about putting evil into them, right? Mm -hmm. When he was talking about that the context has such a powerful tool that we still have this misnomer that, oh, no, no, that, that person was evil to start with, and we're just drawing that out of them. Yeah. And, and I love that, that Zimbardo comes back and says, no, we're actually the, con the situation, the context is helping create that in them. Yeah, and which is interesting because you can then look at what John was also saying about priming and the fact that you can't prime something that somebody doesn't already believe or want yeah, right. this idea right. of being able to suddenly change somebody drastically isn't there yet there is that aspect of the situation and how does that frame our our self-identity and our reference point and to that, this idea of Milgram's experiments and Zimbardo's experiments and Ash's conformity experiments, all those old ones and mm -hmm. all the new ones that are coming out that are, are, are similar in nature of saying, we don't necessarily understand ourselves as much as we would like to, as we believe we do, right? Um, and yeah. that in these situations we can be manipulated a lot more and our behavior is much is influenced a lot more than we would have anticipated in advance. Yeah. Steve Martin and Joe Marks, the messenger effect, like just who is saying something to us yes. makes a difference. Oh my God. Just who, who it's coming from. Yeah. So. And again, I, I loved John said something. He said, uh, you know, is that we have this, arrogance or this that we we have this belief oh, that we yeah. know ourselves and we have a belief that we know what we would do in a situation 
And the fact of the matter is, is most of us don't. So I love your idea of putting everybody in an experiment, everybody in the world in an experiment, <laughs> ask them, Just how one. would you respond to this? Now, and again, I think we might need to do two or three experiments because in all of these, it's never a hundred percent. Well, the, the cell phone study was no. pretty high, but I mean, for most yeah. of them, it's still yeah. 60 or 70% of the people do this, but that means that there's 30 to 40% that don't. So they're going to go, oh, see, I told you, I told you I was going to act this way and therefore I will. But then you put them in situation number two and maybe there's going to be less of that people that are going to do that and then you put them in situation number three and then you'll see that which actually leads me to think about that would be a cool longitudinal study about like predicting your behavior and seeing how you do it and putting people through some of these and is there something with certain individuals that they are able to withstand some of the the situational influences that are placed on them. So in other words, if you ran people through five different studies and you found a certain small subset of those people that every time were able to predict how they were going to show up, that could be a cool study. There we go. Some researcher out there, come call us and talk to us. We're going to, we'll we'll work with you. All right. What else, Tim? How how about uh, his his comments about leaders and leadership? We were talking about Simone Biles, and uh, I just thought it was really cool that he tees up this idea that the leaders have to give the example to everybody else. That sometimes you have to do something different. You have to buck the system. Right. You have to act outside of conformity. And it reminded me of Francesca Gino's Rebel Talent, yeah. where it and and. Her she has her book Rebel Talent is fantastic and it's full of great examples and it's not about rebels being rebels all the time right and in every situation it's it's about uh, it's about specific situations it's about a restaurateur that says I'm going to do something different this time mm. I need to separate the brand from every other restaurant how am I going to do that let's bring more passion to play yeah. And so we're going to be inspired by, uh, you know, by Lou Reed, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to play some Lou Reed and then we're going to create a dish based on that. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a, a good rebel thing to do. And so I love that John brought that up, especially kind of given the Olympics and what's, you know, what's been happening here recently. Yeah. I liked how he talked. It's like that pioneers and leaders give an alternative example to oh, what yeah. the prevailing norm is. Mm-hmm. And think about that. Think about Simone and what that alternative example cost her, and yet yeah. what it what yeah. it meant for her, as well as the thousands, if not millions, of people who admire her and are now saying it's okay. I can I can do this because my hero has done this, and. And if you're a leader in an organization, you have to understand that people look up to you. Your example is what people are emulating. And by being able to break the conventional norms of how we work, you are leading, again, with that rebel aspect. Which in part reinforces our need to have leaders that are not just middle-aged white guys. (laughs) Right? Yes, that it's important for us to have leaders that look like the world. Yeah, right. So, so that all people can be inspired, not just a handful of people can be inspired. I so that I agree one hundred percent. So we, yeah. that's which is why we don't lead. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Oh my <laughs> god. Oh, oh. This, so um. Another piece that he talked about that I thought was really fascinating was the power conversation. This idea that when you give somebody power, that is a test of their true character. And this idea that power, you know, corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, I think is more along the lines of power unveils who we are. And so again, going back to these things that you can only be primed for things that you already want to or, or believe. Well, power kind of is just a different way of looking at that. It just, it just uncovers the the reality of who we are. So. 
you said that perfectly. I, I have nothing to add to that, really. Well, well done. Well, and I think. Well, yeah. all right. So here, I, I'll add to my own thing. So, <laughs> good. So, for, as a, as a leader, right? One of the things that I think this implies is that if I'm trying to promote somebody, and I go, "Oh, they're going to change because of the new situation that they're in," that I've I've seen them exhibit negative aspects of power or I've seen them exhibit positive aspects of power, right? You get they're they're, they're leading a team, they're leading a, a project, whatever it is, and you see how they operate. That is going to be much more of an indication of their future behavior when they're given more power that the, if you give them a little power and see how they respond. And that shows what, will be more likely to happen in future. Again, it's going out to, you know, people who take um, interviewees out to restaurants, not to necessarily see and ask them questions, but to see how they treat the wait staff who have a definitely lower on the power totem than they are. Yeah. And yeah. there's some value in that. Uh, ag agreed. And uh, it reminds me of how difficult it is to predict behaviors, but how we treat each other is is something that's pretty consistent about uh, across across our lives. Those tend to be things that we change very little. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Which goes to, I think, his the last point, the, the question, like, what's your wonderful insight that you're going to leave instead of just hugging your kids like oh, you did yeah, last time. Right. Yeah. But I, I love this idea that we have more influence than we think. And I talked about leaders before, but it's everybody, right? We all have influence over the people in our lives, much more so than we think again, because we emotions are contagious because we prime people by what we do and our examples. We set those alternative examples or we set the examples. They don't even have to be alternative. And so be a good example, right? I love that. I, yeah. There's a ripple effect, as he says, that comes out of that. And so be the best person that you can be. This particular message and lesson struck me the brightest and hardest and, and most vividly when we were at the University of Pennsylvania a couple of years ago and we met Chris, the amazing Christina Bicchieri. Oh, yeah. And and when we were talking to Christina, which like sitting in her presence is like being under a bright light, <laughs> you know, a bright hot light, uh, which is fantastic. But we were talking about social norms and I remember – this is the way I remember it. Okay. So who, who knows how correct my memory is, Kurt, but I remember her turning to me and she, and I'm, I'm asking about, so how can we influence social norms? I mean, social norms are so big and they're, they're overwhelming. And she looks at me and she says, but Tim, you're part of the social norm. Hmm. You have the ability to change that. And it was humbling and exciting and inspiring all at the same time to have this amazing researcher, you know, turn and say, you're part of the norm. You can influence it. And, and so when I, when we were listening, to, when we were talking to John about this, Christina's uh, image was going through my mind. Yeah, it's, but it's true. We all are part of that social norm. Yeah. And so what we do makes a difference. Yes. What we do makes a difference. And I think, you know, that is such a great message. So go out, hug your kid, and then just be the best person that you can be and make that example for everybody. So, all right. Not not based on what, how you feel at that moment, but really who you are in totality. Yes. Who, who, you know, connect to your deeper self. And connect to the larger community and connect to yeah. the, you know, this isn't about you. This is about being good because you're influencing others. So- Wear your mask. Go get vaccinated. Go, yes. you know, support people that are doing good things in this world. Reach out to others that might be more disadvantaged. Go and do that. Don't sit on your laurels and expect others to do it because you need to be the shining example that others look up to. And you'll be able to influence them much more than you than you even know. All right, Tim, I think we've pontificated enough. I think it's time to wrap this up. What do you say? 
Okay. Okay. That sounds All good. Right. So John, I think left us with some very wonderful advice about how to be a good person. And I want to remind parents to hug their kids, as I said, and to let your friends know that you care about them and to do things that don't just feel good in the moment, but really reflect who you are, just as you said, and that we are much more influential than we think. And that by being the good example, we are influencing those around us to be good and better. Well said, Pastor Kirk. Well said. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> <laughs> we need to be reminded of the basics, though. I, let me say this. I need to be reminded well, of, we of all these do, basics. Tim, we all do. Man, I sometimes wish it weren't the case, but I wish I just learned a lesson once and like that's all I needed. But unfortunately, we need to be reminded sometimes, and John did a great job of reminding us of some really important messages. Yeah. So as John said, add a little humility to your life because we aren't going to easily predict how we would act in a specific situation. So again, take that, make sure that we're thinking through these things and just come at it with some grace and humility. As Brad Shuck would say, let's get, have a little more grace in this world, right? And one more thing, we hope that you will listen in next week for our episode with Richard E. Nisbet. Oh my God, another luminary in this field. We have just yeah. been so lucky uh, lately. A great so social psychologist whose work on how we think about things or how we think about how we're thinking about things or how we think about <laughs> thinking and thinking. And, you know, just, it, I know. It's about how we it's think great. and it's awesome. And he helped expand what we know about why we do what we do. Absolutely. So, Groovers, we hope you've enjoyed our combination of these past couple episodes, both with Phil Zimbardo and John Barge. And that next week, you'll check out our conversation with Richard Nisbet. And we hope that you'll share your joy for our podcast in the form of a rating or a review. Yeah, that'd be nice. Just there cut, you go. Go for cut it. Cut yourself loose. Yeah. yeah. Be the uh, example for <laughs> others and yeah. show <laughs> them the love and how they can show the love more. Yeah. So this week, we hope you go out and find your groove.